Computational chemistry is so special among all the branches of chemistry because it is a subset of physical chemistry that applies the laws of physics to actually understanding molecular nature. Well, computational chemistry is uh, uh, unique in chemistry because it's not experimental. I mean, certainly the history of uh, uh, chemistry had very much its roots in doing experiments. And then eventually, uh, theoretical chemists became uh, more involved. And then uh, eventually, in the 1950s, computers uh, came on the scene, so it made uh, one be able to do uh, calculations that were inconceivable um, you know, in the absence of computers. <clears throat> so there's been a, a gradual uh, evolution, but the roots of chemistry are in experimental science, and it's only been uh, with the advent of computers that computational chemistry has been able to uh, make uh, significant contributions. After my PhD, I was looking into protein uh, folding. You know, people say that this is the biggest thing that we want to solve, and if there, if the wrong fold, you can get disease. You know, um, wrong fold again. So you know, so you can apply computational chemistry almost to anything, uh, any uh, uh, branch of science, all type of chemistry that you can apply computational techniques. I'm an investigator at the Biomedical Research Foundation of the Academy of Athens in Greece and uh, I have a lab uh, with uh, many students. So the day starts with uh, mentoring the students. Um, so we're um, trying to uh, address different problems, um, start calculations, uh, that not always work, <laughs> so we have to troubleshoot, uh, see uh, what's going on. Uh, we also uh, engage daily in collaborations with experimental scientists uh, in my field, uh, which is called computer-aided drug design, which helps the advancement of new lead compounds. Also, in the day, a day in the life of computational chemists uh, has uh, sci science outreach. So we work a lot with social media, um, papers we publish, or lectures, or uh, interesting papers that we find in the literature. Um, we uh, reach out uh, to the other scientists, but also to the general public. I guess a good day is one where, in the middle of all that, or as part of all that, you learn something, you get a new direction, you have a new insight, that's a good day. So then home, dinner, maybe probably work after dinner about 50% of the time and then walk the dog. I started out as an experimentalist in graduate school at Georgia Tech uh, doing mass spectrometry and then I did a postdoc in x-ray crystallography with Tom Stites at Yale University and I spent a lot of time with computers um, trying to solve crystal structures and I was fascinated by the use of uh, computers and algorithms and I thought when I start my career that's what I want to do. I want to figure out how to understand intermolecular forces better um, through computational chemistry. The field has evolved enormously in some ways and in some ways not so much in the past 20 years. And a lot of times if you go back to early papers in the field you can see the very clearly things that we're working on and insights we're still using. At the same time the growth in computer power has been almost unimaginable for when we're you know 20 years ago and we can do things that we just couldn't do before and couldn't even expect to do. So it's really opened up new possibilities. Wow, the field has evolved so much in the past 20 years. You talk about 20 years was the time when I got my PhD. It was 1999 exactly. This is 2009, right? Mm -hmm. right. So you, when I was doing my PhD, right, it was very tough. The computer is very slow. You just do things that you have to wait for your results on months, right? Um, I just give an example. When I was doing my lipid bile system for my simulation in 1999, it took three months on Octane to run one nanosecond. Right. It's very slow. 
So now at 2009, we were able to compute two, one million particle simulations. You're amazing. That cannot be done, you know, during 20 years before. And nowadays, if you run the simulations, 50 nanosecond is going to be very difficult for you to convince the editor your paper can be published in your journal. So artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think, are here to stay because we have not invented them uh, now, <laughs> this year or the last decade. We've actually, uh, the field has been working with these techniques since a long time, but uh, very recently uh, they have been recognized because of the advent of big data. So, but with the advent of uh, big data, we now have the power to uh, leverage all this information and transform it uh, into a meaningful uh, data that, that can help us accurately predict bio and physical chemical phenomena. So yes, artificial intelligence machine learning is here to stay, but they've been here for a very long time. So it's, uh, I find it somewhat amusing that uh, there's this uptick in interest in artificial intelligence. Now, when I was a graduate student in the 1970s, artificial intelligence was a, a big field. It was recognized and talked about, and I even worked uh, on a program for E.J. Corey as a graduate student. He was developing the LASA program, which is a program that does retrosynthetic analysis. And that program was very much considered to be an AI uh, program. So somehow or other, in the last few years, people all of a sudden discovered AI. Uh, but it's been here, you know, at least through my entire uh, career, you know, going back to the 1960s or 70s. And machine learning, I, I think, is, uh, um, is nothing new either. Uh, uh, you know, one uh, tries to write software that may uh, take advantage of new information and you update uh, the algorithms based on new information. So AI and machine learning are not the least bit new. The only thing that's new is that there's a larger uh, community that uh, is now talking about them. I guess the, my problem that I work on the most and that I really understand and appreciate and would like to see solved the most is a core problem in computer-aided drug design, which is essentially a situation where wouldn't it be nice if the biologist could come to the computational chemist and say, make me a small molecule or maybe another protein that will bind this protein so I can use it to treat a disease. We could do you know, a week, maybe a month of calculations, come back with a design, the chemist would make it, and it would work. That would be game changing. Um, I would like to see solve the protein folding problem. I think we're also very close uh, to solving it with, uh, as we said, with the recent advances in uh, machine learning. Imagine if there would be a world without having the need to solve a crystal structure. Uh, that would be fantastic if we could a priori predict the fold of a particular protein. Of course, protein crystallography would still be needed uh, in case you wanted to co-crystallize drugs on those proteins, but that would solve uh, a real problem in uh, drug design. I would say that uh, it's really important to learn a large range of techniques learn how to do some coding, um, and not try to stick to any particular one method. It's better to try to solve a global problem and then figure out the methods you need to use. So as you're getting your education, the more experience you have with different techniques in computational chemistry, the more successful you will be during your career. So uh, JCIM has helped uh, propelling computational chemistry uh, in that it promotes publishing excellent science, new tools and technology. Uh, it also highlights current progresses in the field with thematic issues. JCIM is advocating for the role of uh, women computational chemists in the field and we have an upcoming special issue on the thematic of women in computational chemistry.
We recognized as a community that the ACS needed a journal that focused more on quantum chemistry and uh, uh, physics-based modeling uh, and methodology, which is what JCTC does. Uh, so JCTC is uh, more towards uh, physics than, and JCIM is more towards uh, in informatics. I guess one of the things that most inspires me in the field are my colleagues and collaborators. I've, as I've gotten older, I've become more and more impressed with their vision, their dedication, their technical horsepower, and, uh, and what great people they are. So that's something that really matters a lot to me.